here with Jamin Moore and Alex Morgan tonight, Phil Leva. Uh, guys, we have a 2-2 draw on the road against Austin FC. Goals from Jackson Yule and Jeremy Abobasi. I'm mm -hmm. curious as to how you're feeling right now. I know fans have mixed feelings. There are two leads that were lost during this match. However, you go against a tough opponent like Austin and pick up a point. Alex, your initial thoughts. Yeah, I felt like the Quakes could have gotten more out of that match. But it's hard to complain about a, a, law, a, a tie on the road. And so I, I, I think they'll be able to come away happy uh, with that result. And, I mean, it's not entirely unexpected. The, the last few games that the Quakes have played against Austin, a 3-3 draw, a 2-2 draw last year. They played a 3-4 game the year before. These are tend to be high-scoring affairs, lots of draws happening. So this fits the pattern. And they, they remain... Uh, undefeated against Austin FC in uh, Major League Soccer play after six games now, so a, a pretty good uh, a pretty good fixture for the, the Earthquakes. And they are, as somebody just mentioned in the chat, currently sitting in fourth place in the Western Conference behind LAFC, who has a couple games in hand. Who the Quakes will be playing next weekend at Levi Stadium. Uh, Jamin Moore, what do you think? The two two result, a draw on the road for the Quakes. How are you feeling about it? I, I wore a Lululemon shirt, and somehow the comments are for your shirt, Phil. I have no oh. idea what, what I can do from here. <laughs> this is definitely the most uh, expensive shirt I have, and you know because my daughter uh, uh, accidentally um, got a shirt that, that wasn't for her, and they told her to keep it. Anyway, no, it, I mean, 2-2 draw is fine. As a result, if you come into this game and you say, hey, you're going to go into Austin, you know they've never beaten you before, you're going to get out with the 2-2 draw, you're going to get a couple goals, uh, out of that, uh, in general, you know that's a pretty good result. And I, I felt that, I felt that the Quakes weren't. They didn't feel like they were going for the win for me. Like even from the beginning, they looked like they were trying to manage the game and make sure, like somehow Austin, they did, they kept Austin in front of them. And thank you, I appreciate that, Arky. Um, and uh, uh, thank you, thank you, Arky, I appreciate that. Two different people with very similar <laughs> names. That's, that's very confusing. Um, but, but, uh, you know, getting a couple goals tonight, I mean, look, Jeremy Abobasi's goal was, was nice. Uh, you know, uh, that he scored Jackson Yule's goal was nice. These are, you know, and, and having somebody score that wasn't named, uh, you know, Abobasi or, uh, or Espinoza was also nice. So anyway, I actually didn't spend any money on this shirt, Ben Perez, but thank you. <laughs> um, well, my, I, like I said, I my, think... my, my daughter got on an accident. Jamin, I think I missed the memo here because tonight evidently was a black T-shirt night. That's what Luchi Gonzalez was wearing on the touchline. Usually <laughs> we go. see that's, him. That's why I kept mine on, Alex. I, I was it, like, I'm not gonna. I'm, I'm gonna be wearing my shirt during the show tonight because I well, wanted to. Usually it's a nicer <laughs> fit. Usually he goes for the button down or the sweater. But tonight was, I guess, athleisure night, and I completely missed the memo. So see, this I is what you get after a draw. You get you get <laughs> you get shirt commentary. Yeah. Hey, let's let's talk about some uh, analytics here. No so, on, Alex, sure. yeah. <laughs> One of the things that uh, we kind of picked up on during the match was the press. In the first five minutes, Austin was pressing really hard. We noticed, and um, the Quakes had to discover ways to break through that. I kind of had mentioned before the show to you, Jamin, that yeah. Carlos Capo was kind of instrumental in that. It led to eventually what would end up becoming the goal that Jackson Yule scored. So maybe kind of talk about the Quakes as they work through Austin's uh, tactics here pressing and how they were able to deal with that yeah well at first it wasn't very good but but that's actually a couple things first off it's been kind of normal to see the quakes struggle against a press on the road to start games off this season uh, because they tend to get high pressed on the road that's what teams do particularly before it gets hot in the summer months if it's not too hot out hey we're going to run a high press tonight we're at home we got to be the the protagonist right and the quakes were like yeah, you're going to be the protagonist. We're going to be the antagonist, and we're going to try to like counter you. It, you know, in so, at some level, it it was it was fine. Um, they they were steadfast in trying to play out of the back. Why? Because when they were successful, you know, as we've talked about on the show before, then they've got numbers going their way and into the attack. And so, generally speaking, I thought that element of it worked okay except when it didn't. I mean, and so, you know, once you they figured, the Quakes figured out how that press was going to be run, uh, you know, then they did a better job breaking it. And yeah, Carlos Acapo and, and a couple others did a better job. Other people, not so great, um, but it got better as the game went on for the most part. 
And Alex definitely is frowning all over the place and ready to say something. <laughs> Here we go. Because I'm just wondering what he's frowning about. Jay, I was I was going to agree with your characterization. Give me some credit okay. here. Um, I, yeah, no, I, I, just, I see you actually, frowning down there. Are you looking at comments or what are you doing? I, I, I think the Quakes did a good job playing out of the back. I want to give them credit. And, and I, I, the only thing I'm not sure about is if you're giving them enough credit. They, I, I, I had thought this could be a long night because of the way that Austin were pressing in the first few minutes. There were two early turnovers. I thought it was going to be worse than it yeah, was. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. And then about. the Quakes yeah, yeah. built out of the back a couple times really well. And they started to find that long switch to Espinosa. Mm -hmm. They started to place through uh, Jeremy Abobasi, who did a really good job tonight getting involved in the buildup, uh, you know, uh, posting up, uh, letting the midfielders play off of him and then circling around and getting into the box. I mean, that's essentially how, how the Quakes scored, uh, you know, how he scored his header. And, 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 you know, we saw that happen multiple times tonight. So the build out tonight was, was really, really good. And that was something that I was worried about given the you know, fatigue after the midweek game, given the way that Austin were pressing them, given the travel, but completely didn't materialize. So I, I, I think we have to to give the the back line a lot of credit for that. Yeah, that build out. Second, second half better better uh, than the first, and also um, and 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 really getting that ball out to Espinoza for the second goal. Right, uh, clearly uh, those situations. Once they were able to to make those switches out, and and uh, Grezzo getting on the ball. Acapo getting on the ball, both of them brought some quality into those situations. But you know, there is there is going to be a turnover. There's going to be at least one or two turnovers a game anytime that the Quakes get pressed like that. We've seen it every single game. It's about how they manage those situations. And you know, there was some a situation that I thought was going to turn out to be pretty scary. And and credit to uh, credit to Mensa because he made the bad pass and yeah. then he didn't panic. And I think like that's a huge change because if that was Nathan last season, he would immediately gone after that ball. And if they won to him and they're out, now the jailbreak is on, right? Instead, Mensa just kind of calmly drops, kind of just, you know, and, and along with, with Rodriguez, and they kind of just waited to see how Austin were going to play. And they just kept kind of gliding back. And Austin just basically bailed the Quakes out with, with a bad pass. And, you know, that's something that, uh, you know, a veteran like, uh, like Mensa understands happens a lot in MLS. There's there's something that's almost just like like uncannily calm about the <laughs> way that it? Mensa defends. So it's it's almost disconcerting, Jamin, the way that he gives away like a really bad turnover and then it's kind of just gliding across the field. And he's in the perfect position to cut out the ball. He knows exactly what he's doing. But I'm just so used to see seeing Nathan react like like, you know, something out of like Tom and Jerry where he has a massive jump scare and then like slips on a banana peel or something. I'm so used to that that it's it's a little disconcerting to just see how composed uh, Jonathan Mensa is out there. And he, he handled that that counterattack really well and, and you know, has been really solid, uh, uh, you know, breaking uh, up those chances this season. I, I mean, I think the only thing that, you know, the Quakes can really complain about today was the defending uh, in the air because that's how both of the, uh, the Austin, you know, goals happened, and that's not something we've seen uh, the Quakes be really vulnerable to this season. But but Austin were getting those numbers in the box, in the far post, uh, and the Quakes didn't really look prepared to handle that. And so, Alex, actually, I was going to ask you about this because I think the reason why Austin had to resort to that style of play was because Lucci was employing the low block at certain times to defend in order to hold the lead for the Quakes. So that was something that you actually brought up in the Slack chat was right before. Austin scored was that tactical approach that Lucci was taking for the team to hold on to that lead. And it was the vertical play from Austin that led to the goal. So your take on kind of Lucci's tactical approach there after the quick score on the road and try to maintain the lead. Yeah, I think this was probably the lowest we've ever seen the Quakes defend under Lucci Gonzalez. For the first, you know, 10, 15 minutes, that line of confrontation kept, you know, dropping further back and further back and further back. And it, it ended up, you know, they were defending almost entirely in their own half. That's where they were confronting. And the low block was really quite effective. I mean, they let Austin FC's center backs play with the ball. They let the, the, the central defensive midfielders play with the ball. And they just got numbers behind and let them cycle the ball around back. Let the, the center backs drift into space and dribble and, and take a couple of harmless long shots. So the Quakes really weren't allowing uh, any chances through the middle 
it was really only on those dangerous turnovers uh, where they looked, uh, you know, vulnerable a couple times. And, and then the, you know, the, the, the two uh, long balls into the box where they, where they let slip and, and, and uh, you know, uh, got overwhelmed with, with numbers in the air. And Jamin, I'm interested in your thoughts about the subs as well, because if you look at the subs on paper, I think it's pretty clear that, you know, Lucci was trying to hold on to the lead here. He's subbing in Tanner Beeson, bringing in, you know, more of a defensive presence for the team. And yet, if you watch the match, if you were to go back and watch it, you'll see that the Quakes were actually playing quite on the front foot. Like, they were playing pretty offensively throughout, and it looked like they could have even, like, walked out of Austin and, like, snuck off with three points. At the very end of the match there, we saw Tommy Thompson getting involved. We saw uh, Christian Espinoza being incredibly dangerous, as he often is, running towards the end line and crossing balls back across the box. I mean, uh, what are your thoughts on these subs here and, and you know, I'm, I'm actually curious about what, how Lucci is going to respond to this, you know, first and foremost. But, I, you know, before we have that opportunity to talk to him, what your thoughts are in terms of how the team continued to play at the end of the match with those particular subs. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to get into the press conference now. I'm just being told the meeting is starting. Oh, look, there's whole music. Let me uh, mute that. Uh, I'm listening. I have the I have the the whole music on right yeah, now. It's really yeah, nice give me, and peaceful. Give me one I was second. just zoning out from what <laughs> I just what realized. I hadn't uh, I hadn't started the press conference yet, so let me get that uh, going here. So oh, there it is. I was hoping. Can we, can we share? Can we share the whole music with the audience, Jamin? Because because this, oh, this is can really we share nice. the whole music? Oh, I think they're probably hearing it right now. Honestly, yeah. Can you guys hear it? Yeah, that sounds familiar. Actually, I feel like I've heard that somewhere before. Yeah, that's the, that's the whole. Hey, just a couple notes while we're waiting for the press conference to start here. I thought it was pretty cool how Austin FC honored Willie Nelson. I mean, Willie Nelson is one of my favorite songwriters. 90 years old today uh, from, you know, made most of his, his most famous music in that area after he left Nashville. But I thought that was pretty cool, a pretty cool thing to bring up for what they had in terms of their TIFO. So if folks didn't see that, I would recommend going to check it out. Um, Jamin, just, swinging the question uh, back over to you in regards to it looks like yeah the, the substitutes. I'm uh, yeah, we're uh, trying to see what's going on here. So uh, yeah, from a substitute side, there was some interesting stuff going on, and Alex and I were we talking about it right before he came on. So I think he's going to ask Lucci a question. Depends on what order we get called in. Maybe we'll. I see already how it promised goes. I would. I promised on right. Twitter that I, so, I would so, ask about so, Jamin. So Alex is promising that he's going to ask about the substitutions. I also need to ask about Acapo's injury. Uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, it seemed pretty clear he went off with, with a hamstring. So, um, yeah, <laughs> is that what you just saying? <laughs> yeah, it's a weird, it's exactly a weird song. That is. And, and yeah. unfortunately sometimes we're putting up with it in our ear and I got to like mute multiple things here in order to, so you don't hear it and I don't hear it. And, uh, anyway, it's a little annoying. Um, so yeah, that's right. We are, <laughs> we are uh, on hold for the press conference. I'm asking right now, can you please upgrade us so we don't hear the whole music anymore? Uh, anyway, so yeah, what was really interesting was that. Uh, instead of seeing the sub that we would have expected to see, Benji Kakanovich coming on for, you know, Cade Cowell, we actually saw Miguel Trauco coming on for Cade Cowell. Now, there's an open question here, which is, was Miguel Trauco going to be playing left wing? Or was Paul Marie going to wing? I quick going to play with two left backs. So, you know, the problem is we never got to find out because Acapo immediately after the substitution, I think there's a corner or something, he grabbed his hamstring and we never got to like zoom out and see how the Quakes were going to set up after that substitution. So it was really interesting time. It was really close the door. Close the door. Yeah. Yep. 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 Close the door. I can close pick up Jamin. Go ahead, Alex. I I, I, I think it was interesting timing, but I don't think the timing is what interested me or the, the fans. I think what was interesting was the choice of personnel to, to play Tommy Thompson on that left wing. Because I think we've seen it all now. We've seen center mid Tommy Thompson. We've seen right back Tommy Thompson. You know, we've seen Tommy Thompson pushing forward a little bit more. I don't think we've seen Tommy Thompson on the left side in that left wing position before and uh so we, we didn't we he saw play some didn't he play some winger game. though i think he was more of a right winger but didn't he play some winger when he first he came was on definitely more of a right winger because i remember yeah. watching him run to the end line and crossing balls in which he actually does fairly well but i think coming from the left side he's having to more like cut back and 
having to do different things with his feet, right? I think even at one point we saw Tommy try to take a shot off of a volley from that side because it was on his preferred foot. So anyway, back to your, your point here, Alex, about uh, Tommy Thompson. Well, the point is that is it, it's a massive indictment of Benji Kakanovich. And you know we should preface this by saying we don't know if Benji Kakanovich is fully fit or not. It might be the case that he picked up a knock uh, midweek against Monterey when he was subbed off at halftime. Um, but then the question is, why is he on the bench in the first place? If he's not available, what is he offering as a substitute other than, you know, a warm body on the bench, other than you know, maybe being a decoy? I, I don't understand why they'd bring him to Austin if he's not available to play in the, you know, situation that clearly calls for him to play where the Quakes, you know, wanted a, a second goal. Uh, and they wanted energy in the attack, and they, you know, had room on that left wing for a substitution. I, I, I don't understand why Benji Kukanovic was not brought on in that situation. And it leads me to believe that maybe, you know, Luchi Gonzalez has lost trust in, in Benji Kukanovic after, uh, you know, the, the performance, the poor performance against Monterey Bay, after, you know, a string of underwhelming performances where it looks like his body language is off. It, it, it seems like something seriously wrong. Uh, and, don't want to read too much into it, but we, we're definitely going to ask uh, about it in the press conference to, to see what the update uh, is on Benji Kikanovich. Because, you know, if it's true that Benji Kikanovich has been dropped for Tommy Thompson, if I were Benji Kikanovich, I'd be trying to get the first ticket out of San Jose because there's well, no I, reason for him to stick around if he's playing behind Tommy Thompson. I think, uh, if I think he's lost his spot. Well, he was actually, uh, you know, if that's the case, let's assume that that's the case for now. Uh, he was actually dropped for Miguel Trauco. Tommy Thompson came on because a capo got injured. So that is, you know, maybe Miguel Trauco, maybe they think he can play some left winger. Maybe he's got some experience with that uh, in uh, other teams and other leagues. You know, I don't think like he, he play he plays that for Peru ever. Uh, but we know that uh, Marcos Lopez has. And so, you know, we uh, maybe, uh, you know, we'll be able to get a little bit more from Lucci when, when we get a chance to talk to him. Right, and this is also assuming that they keep a very similar formation as to what Lucci has been playing throughout as well, which is the 4-3-3, which we don't necessarily know what would have happened if Carlos Acapo hadn't gone out. Alex, it looks like you have something you want to say about that. Well, they didn't switch afterwards. Tommy Thompson was basically playing like a normal left-wing position. They stuck For with sure. their 4-3-3 formation. Like they, were, they were forced into that formation at that point, like... Perhaps that's what they were going to go with. We don't know whether or not it was going to be Miguel Trauco who would have played as as a winger or or what. But they were kind of like forced into that. And I kind of I kind of feel like at that point you kind of stick with what you have, right? Because you have an emergency right. situation. We're going to the we press conference. Uh, so good evening, we'll everyone. We're now joined by head coach Lucci Gonzalez. So let's go straight into questions. Take a first one from uh, Jimmy Moore. Unmuted. Hi, Lucci. Thanks for uh, talking with us tonight. Uh, you know, congrats on the point. Um, Probably not the outcome you were hoping for, given the op the opportunity to have the lead twice in the game. But how do you feel that the team executed the game plan that you set out for them tonight? And uh, what do you think uh, you know needs to be sharpened up uh, for LAFC coming up next? Thanks. Muted. Yeah, thanks, Jimmy. Look, the point's good. It's a it's a positive point for sure. Um, this is not an easy place to play. Great, good fan base and you know an exciting club, a new club. So. And they did very well last season. I mean, it's so early in the season. So, you know, I, I, I'm proud of the guys. I thought we dueled well. I thought we won battles. I thought we uh, were organized defensively in our shape. We made it difficult to play through. Every diagonal ball was we had we had to shift and, and reorganize. And you know, so I thought overall in the run of play defensively we were good, and we actually created some good offensive transition, winning the ball in the midfield, winning the ball lower mid height few times high and creating offensive transition till the end. I thought we were actually quite dangerous at the end, even when we switched to, to five in the back. So, you know, credit to the boys. I, I thought they showed up to play in a difficult environment with a disappointing result midweek and, and last week and, and responded. So, so we'll grab that, you know, and moving forward, you know, can we get re more, can we get reorganized quickly on that throw at the end of the first half? Can we maybe not give away that corner and then defend it better? Of course. We have to keep look. We have to keep getting better, uh, but but I think we are improving in our ability to compete uh, away. And I think one of these games is going to bounce for us, uh, not at home, to get the three points. And we just got to keep working and believing in that. 
Thank you, Coach. Next question, Alex Morgan. Hi, Luchi. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, good to speak to you. Uh, I, I'm wondering about the the substitutions uh, in the second half. What the thinking was, um, you know, first with the the Trauco substitution, whether the intention was uh, to have him play left wing, to have Palmeri play left wing, or to to switch formation entirely, uh, and then you know having Acapo go down right after that. Um, you know what the thinking was bringing on on Tommy. And in, instead of you know the obvious substitution, uh, which which might have been Benji Kukanovic. Yeah, look, the the switch, the initial idea with Miguel was uh, Miguel fullback, Paul on the wing. We we saw them creating a lot of overloads, two versus ones on that side. K worked really hard. He, he was dangerous in transition, and but it was hard. hard, hard. I mean, like low defensive moments, which. It's not his, his biggest strength, you know, he's an attacking minded player, but he made a big sacrifice for the team and, and did it well. And we thought at, at, at that point, we wanted to get uh, Miguel on the back line and Paul to give us that defensive uh, safety, you know, the two versus two in the overload, especially on the diagonals, and then still have the ability to, to move the game forward, push the game forward, get crosses and get, get into the attack because he's a winger as, as in his background. Uh, when a couple went down, unfortunately, um, you know, we, we had to obviously pivot again and make an adjustment. Uh, and so we put Paul on the right and then Tommy, you know, feeling just seeing how the game was going again. We wanted a player that has that experience of helping defend low and recover the ball and keep possession and to be able to play forward. And Tommy even almost scored twice. So, like, you know, Tommy's a very versatile player, Swiss Army knife type player. And I thought he came in and did well. So those were the reasons for the adjustments. Next question, Mark, are you calling? Hey, Luchi. Um, how disappointing was it when you guys get the goal in the 75th minute from Abobasi and then just keep giving them the momentum right back to them three minutes later when they score the equalizer like that? Like, you know, at that point, are you, you know, are you just frustrated with the way the team was able to defend right there or just what was going through your mind at that point? Yeah, look, at the end of the day, day that in terms of the game as a whole, we, you know, it's, I thought we were, we had a positive performance. We created volume and crossing. We were, very dangerous in transition and open attacks. And then, um, and it's a great goal by, by Jeremy. Um, not sure why the linesman raised his flag, but but anyway, it's like, um, you know, you know that these teams that they're at home, they're gonna throw everything at you. And, and for sure, yeah, no, there's there's definitely disappointment that the new locker coming in, like it doesn't, you know, it, a tie is a good uh, positive result because you, you're summing, especially away, but uh, we, we want more than that more than that and that's credit to our mentality the guys want to compete uh the staff but um look it, it's it's something we got to keep learning from and and uh overall in the run of play i thought we we, we were pretty good and we closed look at, when they did tie i thought we did close the game we did a formation change we closed it well bringing tanner beeson in and then we were actually dangerous uh in transition as well we, we got some good pressure on the ball so we we did push at the end to still have the ability to, to create and score in a third so um you know, we got to keep uh, working. We got to, we got to, we're getting closer. We're quick. Every game away, we've competed. I feel well, with the exception of probably one in the scoreline with St. Louis. Um, we got to grab that and know that if we keep working and improving things, it, it's going to bounce our way away. And we got, we believe in that. Thank you. Uh, this last question comes from Bobby Rinkle. He asks, uh, how important will it be to build uh, Levi Stadium for the next week's match against Cali FC? The question is how important it is to fill. I, I don't control that. I don't know. I mean, the more people come out, amazing. Um, we've had a great environment in PayPal. You know, to be fair, we're going to miss that that environment in our stadium, our own stadium. But um, I, we, you know, it's an event to get more fans out there and and get more connection with the Bay Area and our community to support the club and support the game against a, a very talented and good team with LAFC. So. We're going to take a lot of pride in that. We want to bring our best for the fans. So we're excited. And the more people come out, and hopefully it fills up uh, so that we can get as much support as possible to, to be that 12th man for us. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lucci. We'll be having for Jeremy Bosey in a few minutes. Okay. Thanks, guys. Good night. All right. Well, Lucci Gonzalez, noting that every game that they played on the road, with the exception of St. Louis, has been a game that they've competed well in. The Quicks are currently sitting fourth in the in the Western Conference. 
Um, they get a point here on the road, you guys. Ten, ten games into the season, here we are. Um, yes, <laughs> I wasn't going to address this, uh, but I think we should continue with uh, some of our responses to, to the questions that you asked, Lucci. So, Alex, I'm going to go to you first because you directly addressed the, uh, <laughs> the tactical approach, the substitutions, to be a little more particular. And he was very clear in his answer, right? It looks like Paul Marie was going to be the one going up to the top of the formation there to play on the wing. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, that, I mean, that, that last question was, was funny to me. Clearly, the, the, the intended uh, answer would have been, uh, you know, that it was very important for, for the Quakes to, to fill out Levi Stadium next weekend. Um, so maybe he needs to check in with the, the PR team uh, on that one. But, but um, yeah, uh, sounds like there's no, uh, no mention of an injury knock to uh, Benji Kukinovich. Seems like it's safe to assume that it was a tactical decision to drop Benji Kukanovich, not to play Benji Kukanovich in the second half. And um, I, I look, I, I, I don't entirely buy the the, the justification given that that uh, that you know Paul Marie would be a more defensive option at left wing, that Tommy Thompson would be a more defensive option at left wing. I, I think that's only true if you have zero faith in in Benji Kukanovich, right? Because Benji Kukanovich, when he is motivated and when he is, you know, in the right space mentally, clearly, I think, can defend better than, than Tommy Thompson at left wing, you know, just because he's fitter, he's faster, uh, and he's a left winger. Um, so I, I, I think it's a, a pretty, you know, clear indictment of, of, of where Lucci thinks Benji Kukanovich is at right now, the fact that he didn't trust him to fill those defensive responsibilities uh, in the in in the second half, I, I I'm not sure if there's any other way to read it, Jamin. Jamin, you're on mute. Yes, that's what happens when the uh, kid comes in for the third time in a show. Not sure what's going on tonight. Um, yeah, look, let's. I'm going to give Lucci a little bit of the benefit of the doubt here for a couple of reasons. First off. Um, I think the scenario that he presented in terms of why they were going to do the sub that the way that the way that they were going to is a very valid situation. We know that Kate is not uh, a very good uh, defensive winger. Uh, Benji is a bit better. Uh, I'm not going to say he's the best. Uh, he's he's fine. Um, he's, he's very, I would say, average as a as a defensive winger. And in that particular situation, I can't blame Lucci for making a more defensive move. The second thing I would say is it's nice to not be predictable. It's nice that, uh, you know, he's doing something different, maybe something that Austin wouldn't have expected, maybe something that, you know, Trauco could have taken advantage of, maybe something that Tommy Thompson obviously was in a couple of situations able to, to take advantage of. Um, one of the things that we don't talk very much about with Tommy Thompson is he's really good at getting into the box and drawing penalties. Back in 2020, he had four of them four drawn penalties. He's, he's drawn them in the, in the past couple of seasons. And I like his ability to kind of dribble into the box in those situations with tired defenders and see them stick their legs out. It, you know, there's a couple of close situations where I could have seen a potential for him to, to, to draw penalties. So look, you know, is it, uh, again, we, we don't know what was going to happen. Alex, just let me talk, dude. He disagrees, Jamie. Jamie, Jamie, I just, uh, I, I can't uh, believe you're trying to, you're trying to, you're, you're trying to promote Tommy Thompson at left wing. That's why I'm shaking my head. If you say Tommy Thompson is a surprise, you know, left wing. A, a, no, but he know, came on. He came move, on because I'm, I'm, I'm going to laugh at that suggestion, he, Jamie. He can't. He can't. He no, no. Look, he he came on because of an injury. It's not like he was subbed on for Cade Cowell. So let's keep that in mind. That was not the original intention. We would have been instead talking about Paul Marie and how Paul Marie played on the left wing and whether that was a viable option or not had Acapo not gotten injured. We don't even know if Tommy Thompson would have made it in the game. So this kind of sets a little, let that a little bit on the side. I do think Tommy has a bit to offer going forward. And I'm pointing out what I think one of his strengths are, and it's a valid strength. And I can, you know, pull plenty of data that to prove like that's literally one of his best strengths around the box. So, you know, I get it. 
I get it. It's, uh, you know, uh, I do want to see Benji break out of his funk by not playing it. He's not going to break out of his funk. And, uh, you know, and Cade wasn't exactly stellar tonight. Now, you know, Cade did have that uh, that great game, the last home game, and that's only a couple games ago. So you hope that, uh, you know, he's he brings against LAFC and uh, with a week worth of rest, uh, since he hasn't gotten that in the last two weeks, let's see what he brings. I don't know that fans have a lot of confidence that, that Cade will be able to do that. I will say, though, at the beginning of this match that, there were some moments in which Cade would typically dribble straight into defenders, and he had some very nice touches and some nice dribbles as he moved into getting into the box. Um, but at that position, I think Alex, you were you were kind of, kind of getting into this last week. That tends to be the spot that we look towards in terms of what needs the most improvement on this team. Um, yet, is Cade Cowell still going to be the starter moving forward? I think so. Yes. At the position, considering you know what the Quakes have going forward, unless there's a big signing coming, I mean, what do you think, Alex? Yeah, he's gonna be the starter there until right, the we'll Quakes see. go out the and first sign from someone. Alex Morgan. Hi, Jeremy. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, it's good to speak to you. Uh, how are you processing uh, this match tonight? You know, uh, uh, getting a point on the road. Uh, you know, usually not something uh, that you complain about, but maybe felt like um, you guys uh, could have had could have had three in that game. What, 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 what's your takeaway? Yeah, I think there's going to need some further reflection uh, uh, once everything is kind of settled a bit. But ultimately, it is a very, very difficult place to play in. I don't think any team enjoys trying to get three points here. We came here to do that, wanted to get our first road win of the year. We've been agonizingly close on, on a couple occasions, and we felt that this was this was our time to have the lead twice uh, and lose that. I think it makes it a little bit challenging for us to, to accept these uh, or the lack of three points. We uh, went losing the lead at the end of the game. So I think I want to start with that and then work backwards uh, as to the goals we conceded, the pressure that we absorbed and, and you know, where we can create more chances and, and be more lethal to try and kill the game off. Because what we see is that sometimes one goal leads are, are fragile. Uh, and in order to gain confidence, I think that we need to defend with the ball and, and be able to convert our chances as well. Next up, David Morton. Unmuted. Hi, Jeremy. Thanks for taking the time to join us. Uh, you know, it, it really interesting, you know, performance, I think, from you tonight. If I reflect back, you know, a couple opportunities in the first half where you're you're making runs, uh, you know, the balls are able to get in behind. There's trailing runners potentially in those positions. Things could have come off a little bit different. Um, but really that uh, that goal that you got was just, you know, you knowing where to be and, and experience and, and knowing what Christian's going to do in that situation. You know, what did, what did you see uh, developing there? And, uh, you know, what were your thoughts as soon as you saw where Christian was going to be and, and where you thought the ball would end up? Thank you. Muted. Yeah, I think in the first half, there were some opportunities to be a little bit more connected uh, between myself and some of the crossers. But ultimately, other guys were able to get good chances off of some of the other crosses. So uh, it's not as if we uh, lacked in some of those finishing attack situations. Uh, as far as the goal itself, <clears throat> understanding that we just won the ball, Christian was sprung free down on the right wing. I wanted to make sure that I was uh, slowing my movement down to not be in a position where the center backs knew exactly where I was and they could mark me. If I get there too early, then ultimately they can latch onto me and make it hard for me to get separation. So really slowing down that movement and trying to hit uh, different trajectories so that, again, they can't time it. Uh, and ultimately, as an attacker, I want to leave myself as much space as possible to attack the ball uh, because if I'm overcommitted and the ball goes over me, then it's impossible to make something happen. So uh, once I picked my spot out, I made sure that that was something that I could do and while still keeping myself within the frame of the goal. Uh, and ultimately, again, understanding who I was playing against, maybe the size advantage, the athletic Sism advantage. I knew that if a ball was hung up in the air uh, and I was on the attacking end, that 
I had a, a favorable chance of getting it, and, and Christian did a good job of, of giving me a ball that I could work for. Next question, Marco Yukovic. Hey, Jeremy. Yeah, obviously, you guys may be a little disappointed not getting the three points, but still the positive is you guys did get one point out of this game. I just want to know if, you know, after the disappointment in Monterey, uh, did you guys maybe come into this game with a little bit of a chip on your shoulder, uh, knowing you're going to be in a hostile environment that T2 Stadium is, and kind of use that to, you know, spark the team basically, and then getting your goal there in that 75th minute. Uh, you know, you know, what your emotions going through in that in that part? Yeah, there was a little bit of confusion because some of my teammates were worried that it would, might have been offside, um, to which I would have been quite surprised, but ultimately relieved in a, what was a very physical game and where there wasn't a ton in it in the second half especially, and, and they had some, some possession in some dangerous areas. Uh, to get that goal was, was a good feeling, and one in which I felt that we were going to close the game out. <clears throat> as far as the Monterey Bay game goes, it's, it's in the past. It's extremely disappointing to not be competing for the Open Cup, uh, having made you know a, a mini run last year and, and having been a part of runs in previous years. Uh, this team was hungry to do that, uh, but a number of factors didn't go our way. You know, maybe we didn't put our best foot forward on Tuesday, and you know, that game is in the past. We're not carrying that game forward with the rest of the season, trying to prove a point that you know we're better than that day. Uh, we know the standards that we want to keep, and and regardless of what happened in the past, we want to strive to be the best version of ourselves uh, and learn from, from what we can. This last question comes from Bobby Renkel. He asks, uh, the Espinosa to Bobusi combo is starting to become a normal occurrence, almost something similar to Salinas to Wondolowski. How does it feel to be able to score uh, many goals with San Jose and help Christian Espinosa get closer to becoming the all-time assist leader in club history? Yeah, I mean, Christian's going to become the all-time leader, and he doesn't need me for that. He, his quality shines through, and he puts a number of guys in good positions to, to finish off attacks. I think we can be appreciative of the moment tonight, uh, getting another, another you know, Christian to me connection, but we have to be hungry for more. You know, there was an opportunity in the first half where maybe we could have been on the same page, and... I firmly believe that if we can be even more consistent, because the quality is there from his end, he can serve the ball from any angle, any distance from goal. Uh, he knows which way to put, what kind of spin. And, and for me, I believe in myself to, to finish chances if he gives me half chances. So uh, we have to demand more of ourselves so that we can be even more lethal. And, and I know that, as I said, if it's not me that he's putting in a good position, he'll put whoever is making that decisive run. So lots to, lots to look forward to. And I think there's a lot more goals in this team. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jeremy, for your time. Thanks. You know, I really appreciate every time Jeremy Bobasi comes and speaks during the press conference. Like, I, I've already said this before, but he is one of my favorite, too. See, he answers questions so well. He's insightful, uh, thoughtful in his responses. And I think he's kind of in line with some of what Lucci was saying in terms of, like, how to take this result. Uh, j -Bo made it very clear that Austin is a difficult place to play in. And so, you know, getting a point has its value in that itself. I thought it was interesting how he expressed his disappointment in the Monterey Bay result. Um, I know that's something that's still lingering for a lot of Quakes fans in terms of that disappointment. And some of us have different feelings about how the coach and the players are expressing that as well. It seems like j -Bo is reflecting this sort of feeling that they just have to move forward. It's something that happened in the past and they're just going to keep pushing beyond that result. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some of his responses here before we get to the end of the show. Alex, I'm going to go over to you first. I'm interested in your takes as to what j -Bo had to say in this press conference. Yeah, well, I, I think he's absolutely right about Christian Espinosa. Christian Espinosa, you know, provided, you know, he stays with the team, uh, is going to become the all-time top, you know, uh, a, a sister in, in San Jose Earthquakes history. And I was trying to figure out, I think he's actually quite close. I think that if I'm not mistaken, Shea Salinas is currently the leader and has 50 is the number I think I've found. And I think that uh, Christian Espinosa has 47 as of tonight, which would mean he is only 
you know, a few weeks away from possibly taking that record from Shea Salinas. It, Jamie, can you can you help me with the stats here? I think okay, maybe fifty three is what he's I'm two saying. Two away, yeah, he's two away from Shea. Um, I think it's fifty one to fifty three. I think that's what it is. Okay, so so yeah, I, I mean, we'll definitely see him break that this season with the rate that that he's performing, and it's it's actually really amazing how you know the earthquakes are able to get consistent results this season with only two consistent, you know, goal contributors in Jeremy Obobese and Christian Espinosa. It just shows how good they've been. And, you know, to Lucha Gonzalez's credit, you know, how he's been able to get them on the ball, make space for them, and, and the team's been able to create opportunities for them because they are the two guys up top. They're, you know, uh, doing just as much work with, you know, two thirds of the numbers as other, other other teams have, given that you know Cade Cowell and and Benji Kukanovic haven't haven't been contributing. You know, that's interesting. I've, I've been thinking a lot about where the goals are going to come from for this team, and I was looking at one of the graphics that uh, somebody had shared earlier on the Slack on the Quakes Epicenter Slack. I think it was Crystal who shared it, and that Jeremy Abobasi and Christian Espinoza had combined for ten goals. It's eleven now. Um, but just thinking about where those goals are going to come from, and j had mentioned during the press conference the size advantage that he had, and I've noticed that this Quakes team does have a lot of size advantage uh, when they're on set pieces, when they're uh, at corner kicks. We've seen it particularly during this match. Uh, however, they haven't quite been able to capitalize on that quite yet. I'm wondering if that's one of those things, too, that Luchi Gonzalez is talking about in terms of like getting into form and finding ways to win on, on the road, right? Because... There were a couple of moments tonight, we saw it at the end of the match with Jonathan Mensa. we saw it earlier in the match with Rodriguez, where they could have taken an advantage had one of them actually scored with their head. So, Jamin, just reflecting on some of the things that Jabo had to say and talking about things like physicality, the mentality of the team moving forward, playing against LAFC, uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, of course, uh, you know, Jibo is uh, one of the, uh, the absolute best uh, in terms of giving us the perspective of a player. Uh, and talking through the different situations. Um, you know, I, I, what I what I like tonight, and Alex, you know, you mentioned uh, you mentioned his movement tonight. I thought like his movement was about as good as we've seen for a road game so far this season. My screen keeps freezing here. I apologize. Um, uh, it, the for in, for a road game this year, I thought like his his movement off the ball was about as good as we've seen it, and you know, it showed in in a couple different situations. And I mentioned it to him just to see what you know, his thoughts were, and I think he maybe misread my question a bit and, and maybe I could have phrased it a little bit better, but he was, uh, he was doing some of what we talked about in a previous show where he's making those runs to the post and, and Jackson Yule was trailing on a cutback situation that I actually thought Jackson should have gotten to. And I think he let go because he thought someone was behind, behind him and no one was behind him. Um, and I think at the time that would have made it to zero because I'm, I'm trying to remember, I think the Quakes had a one zero lead at that moment. But maybe that would have been the first goal. Uh, so, you know, that was that was one situation in the first half. Obviously, you know, his movement on the goal in the second half, you know, was stellar. Knowing that, hey, he, and he said, like, I knew that I was more athletic. I would be able to out jump their center backs tonight and looking for that right situation to be able to do that and kind of understanding what he needed to do in order to beat Stuver as well uh, in that particular situation. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, there was there was some some really good stuff there. And there were a couple other situations in the first half that uh, I remember in the moment thinking, you know, really good movement from from a Bobasi there that was opening up other situations. Uh, like I think it was the um, the cutback to Montero that ended up being blocked. But when out to to. to uh, kind of space uh, to be able to find. Uh, Montero in that particular situation. And, and Jamin, you know what I want to see? I actually think I do want to see what would happen if you put Paul Murray at left wing, whether Paul Murray would be able to get Jebo better service up top, whether with the pace that he has and with his willingness and eagerness to take on guys on that left wing, if Paul Murray at left wing could, you know, be another way for, for Jebo to get service because Cade Cowell, hasn't been giving him service. Cade Cowell had one cross tonight that he sent into row Z. And, and I think that Paul Marie could be a solid option at left wing, uh, you know, for the next few weeks, because well, look, the ultimate solution, now. 
the ultimate solution is that the Quakes need to sign another left winger. And I think that that's, you know, essentially, you know, clear tonight that they need yeah. to go out in the summer transfer window and get a left winger is, because they need right options that. there. And yeah, the but I think the between the them could be a good option. It. But yeah. the, the Quakes do have Tanner Beeson who can play in that position as well. It's not ideal, but that is another mm. option that they could go with. From your reaction, I kind of feel you there, Jamin, but that is another option. That he doesn't can... get into the attack. But uh, that is only assuming that Cade Cowell is unable to hold on to this position, which I think moving forward, it's been, Lucci's been pretty clear that Cowell is going to be the guy going forward at the left wing position. So yeah, I, don't think, it, I don't think that's even something that is going to be happening. It's it's tough to disagree with Ben Perez, but honestly, I, I'm, you know, it's, I'm kind of 50-50. I would just like to see a little bit more out of the middle of the attack still. Yes, you got a, a Jackson Yule goal tonight. I think that's great. Um, but we really haven't seen much in the final third out of Montero and uh, and Jackson Yule. In fact, if we're being honest with ourselves, Montero is not quite what he was last season at this point. I feel like Montero was, was more, and I think the Quakes depended on him more last year, given the way that the style that they played. And so he was in the game a lot more because he had to cover a lot more ground. And maybe that helped him get into the games more often. Like he's in a better position to be able to receive and play and things like that and, and, and such. But this year we've, we've seen a number of, of games, even home games where, you know, he's just been a, a, a giveaway machine at times that's happened quite a bit. Uh, and he's also on that left. So, you know, I would like to see more out of Montero and I would like to see, uh, you know, uh, some improvement out of the left wing. And again, you know, whether that is Cade, whether that's Benji, you know, honestly, if you want to be able to move these players, you have to play them. And I think that's the rub right now. The rub yeah. is that that if you don't put them on the field, how are you going to be able to move them? So, you know, well, we'll I think that I think that's the situation is one of them has to get one of them has to get hot. Can, can we can we I, I, I feel like we're not giving Montero enough credit here because I, I think the key is that the attack is much more structured than it was last season. Last season, you know, also especially true. in the first also half true. of especially in the first half of, of last season, I think even when Alex Cavello was coach, you know, they were essentially relying on Montero to get on the ball and do everything, relying on him to distribute and create everything in the final third. Absol they don't need absolutely. to do that now because they have patterns of play and build out that are getting the ball to look you know, to Espinosa on the right wing into Jeremy Obosi much quicker. And and he, I, 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 I think that's true. But I think we still underestimate just how important he is. I mean, I don't know if we remember, but it was it was only a few weeks ago that that Montero, you know, got the red card, was out for two games. And I don't think that the Quakes scored in those two games. I'm pretty sure that was the the, you know, the the St. Louis game and the Toronto game. Um, that that he missed with the red card suspension and the national team duty, and they didn't they didn't score. I, I, I think we've already seen this season what the Quakes look like without Jameer Montero in the middle, and I think it shows just how much he's you know contributing to the not not only with the the distribution but with his movement. You know how much you know dynamic energy he's contributing to these this offense that allows the ball to get to Christian Espinosa, that allows them uh, to create these chances going forward. So I I'm not I'm not ready to to jump on Jameer Montero. I think it's very clearly an issue with the left wing, and there's very clearly opportunities on the left wing that are being wasted because Cade Cowell you know isn't where he needs to be. Look, okay. we're, we're we're ten games in. We're 10 names in, and I think this is the first time we've even brought up the Montero thing, but I want to make a couple points before we move okay. on from it. Because uh, last year, and I think I mentioned this on the show before, and I think I mentioned it in an article, you know, he was 20 out of 26 in terms of the expected goals, expected assists type threat that uh, of the, uh, the tens in the league, of the attacking midfielders in the league. He's 20 out of 26 last season. He wasn't much better than that when he was in Philadelphia, and Philadelphia chose to move on from him. He covers a ton of ground. He he tracks back. He wins balls back. He does a lot of great things that are not related to the ability to attack through the middle, so I don't want to dismiss that. Jamiro Montero, I think, is a very important piece of this team, but you need more offensive production out of either him or Jackson Ewell's position. Pick one. I don't really care which, to be quite honest, but you need more attacking production, more expected assists, 
more final third danger out of one of those two positions. And I think the left wing position, we focus on it so much, partially because we're not seeing enough out of that area. You're ever, you know, we're everyone's right when they talk about how great Espinosa has been, how great abobasi has been. Those two players have carried the attack in this team. It hasn't been carried enough by other people. Great. We saw Cade have a great game in the last home game. We saw uh, Jackson get a goal tonight. And I think Jackson's been great in the middle of the field. I just think in the final third between him and Montero, one of them has to produce more. And if neither of them are capable of producing more, I think you need to look for a different option there. And then maybe have three players in a rotation, but bring in someone who can provide that additional danger. And maybe that's Nico Shakiris, who, by the way, is questionable today and was but was not on the bench. So hopefully on his way back uh, soon, because I'd love to see Nick Nico get out there and you know start to show whether he's one of the potential solutions, you know, for the for the attack. All right, let's take it over to the final thoughts here. Um, Alex, we're gonna have you go first. Final thoughts as we head into the match. May 6th, LAFC at home at Levi Stadium. Yeah, I, I'm ambivalent about this one. I think that uh, Jeremy Abobasi is right, that we're going to have to go back and do a little bit more reflection, dive under the hood on this one, because on the, on the one hand, you know, you're getting a draw on the road, which is, uh, you know, a, a good result in, in MLS, no matter what day it is. Um, but on the other hand, this is not a particularly good Austin team. The Quakes have never lost to this Austin team. The Quakes had two leads in this game. So I think they'll feel a little bit hard done by, especially with two goals from defensive, you know, aerial balls in the box. So that's something to watch for. You know, the, the biggest highlight today is the conversation about the left wing and, and what's going to happen there. Um, and, you know, I, I, I honestly am, am a little bit shocked by some of the suggestions that came up tonight, you know, with considering Tommy Thompson a, a viable option there. I, I think it's pretty clear that the Quakes just need to go get another left winger in the transfer market. And that until then you're going to be relying on, on Cade Cowell and on, you know, possibly Paul Murray. So I like that solution being brought up. Um, I, and, and look, I think next weekend is, is going to be a big game because, you know, the Quakes are essentially going to be playing on the road again at, at Levi's stadium. We, you know, heard, heard the word that the uh, allotment of tickets for LAFC fans at Levi's is massive. Uh, and we know that Earthquakes fans aren't particularly, you know, uh, you're, at least the, the hardcore supporters don't particularly enjoy the experience at Levi's because it's a massive stadium, because it, you know, feels a bit like an away game. So it's going to be a difficult match uh, for them against LAFC in that environment. And, uh, you know, having lost to Monterey Bay, having tied tonight, having lost to Rail Salt Lake, three, three you know, tough results in a row, they're, they're going to want to bounce back. All right, Jamin, your last thoughts here as we end the show. Yeah, so first off, you know, another uh, incredible performance from, you know, players like Christian Espinoza and Jeremy Abobasi. Um, You know, the Quakes' defense, again, is good for giving up two goals on the road. Again tonight, it happened. You know, still waiting for this team to give up less than two goals. You know, on the road, I think. Someone can check me, but I think I think it's been in every single game so far. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think there's still some improvement there, but fortunately it looks like the attack, even though they weren't on the ball as much tonight, even though they didn't have quite as much possession as they like to have, you know, did a good job creating the situations and Christian Espinoza is, you know, as, as he has been all season, you know, revelation, he's the MVP of this team. He's potentially, you know, in the conversation for the MVP of the league with the quakes being fourth in the West. If they stay that high or higher and get a home game with this much turnaround uh, by the end of the season, you know, and Christian Espinosa is producing the way he is right now, he is going to be in the conversation for an MVP in this league. And as well, he should be. Um, in terms of uh, someone mentioned that uh, he, uh, he skies the ball, he's actually very interesting, been putting about two thirds of his shots on target this season in previous seasons, less than a third. So in all previous seasons as an earthquake, uh, he puts less than a third of his shots on target. And then suddenly this season, he's getting at least two thirds of his shots on target. It's a big change. Not quite sure all the reasons for it yet, but I'm very interested in spending some time researching it. But uh, obviously, you know, uh, so long as the quakes go, as Christian Espinosa goes, as Jeremy Abobasi goes, um, and a nice goal from Jackson Yule tonight. So, you know, I think you'll take the point on the road. 
But uh, this team really does need to get three points in an upcoming road game here soon in order to be able to maintain where they're at in the Western Conference right now, which is a, a home playoff game. And amazing that we're able to say that, you know, at this point, but you got two thirds of the season to go, including three big ones coming out. You know, what's really frustrating to me going into this match against LAFC, who is one of the better teams in the Western Conference, is that the Quakes are moving away from their actual home, which is PayPal Park, where they are winning games. They're, you know, getting results week to week. And now, and I can tell by looking at the chat that a lot of folks are unhappy about the fact that the Quakes are going to be playing at Levi Stadium. Levi Stadium, a big cavernous venue that is not meant for soccer. I mean, I've been to one soccer match. Actually, I've been to two soccer matches there. I went to the Orlando City match. No, I've been to three. I went to a Gold Cup match, and I saw AC Milan play um, Liverpool. And in every one of those instances, I can tell you that the pitch, it, it's like you're, you're watching the players play on a postage stamp because you're so far away from the action. So there's that as well. And to me, that means that the fans are taken out of the fans are taken out of the game. And it's really important, I think, to this team for the fans to be a part of it as well. There's a reason why the Quakes have been doing well this season at home. It is, yes, because they have a better team. They are more talented. However, it's also because they are getting that fan support as well. Um, so to see them go off once again to play at Levi Stadium, which seeing the game against Orlando was not necessarily a home venue, a home match for them. You know, people were there to see Kaká. I think people are going to be going to Levi's this time to see LAFC because they are one of the hottest teams in the league. They have some of the best players in the league. Uh, Bawanga is like absolutely incredible. Um, he is going to be worth the price of the ticket alone. You know, hopefully he doesn't just, you know, run amok. But LAFC has been doing that to teams. Now, here's one thing that I think we should consider, however, too, is that LA has a midweek match in the CONCACAF Champions League, which is a really high stakes match against the Philadelphia Union. So that could also affect how they come into this match against the Earthquakes. And my hope is that Philly just pummels them and they come off of a, a really awful loss and they're unable to recover in time to be competitive against the Earthquakes at Levi's Stadium. So that's one of my big hopes there. Again, I'm not happy about the match at Levi's. I think the Quakes should be playing in their actual home. Um, I'm not even a huge fan of the Stanford games, honestly. Alex, I had fun with you at the game last time. However, I would say the traffic is awful. Um, it's, it's not necessarily their home venue. They belong in San Jose. So I want to invite all, all the folks who joined us here tonight on YouTube, or if you're listening on Spotify or one of our other um, services in which we are publishing us in podcast form, check out quakesepicenter.com. If you look on the bottom of the screen here, those of you who are with us right now on YouTube, we have our Patreon listed there. So for just $2 a month, you can become a patron of Quakes Epicenter, and you can support this show here, The Aftershock, and you can support our journalists and producing the content that they produce. So things like going down to the Coachella Valley during preseason and covering the team, or the articles that are being written by our wonderful writers like Robert Jonas, for example, who I'm sure will be joining us very soon right here on the Aftershock. So I'd like to invo invite folks to go check that out. Five bucks a month, you can also get access to the Slack, which is a lot of fun. I've been a little bit more active in there. I'm trying to find time to like get in on the conversation. It's so much fun to join everybody in the Earthquakes talk, talk throughout the week. And it's hard to keep up sometimes. Cool. There's, a lot, there's a lot moving in the Slack at all times. Yeah. Yeah. There's emojis. It's fun. There's like, there's all kinds of cool stuff for you to check out in there as well. So five bucks a month, you can get access to the Slack. And the last thing, make sure you go over to our social media at Instagram and Twitter and follow us at Quakes Epicenter and make sure you like and subscribe to our show right here on YouTube. Turn on those notifications. Jamin, you got one more thing before we get out. I do have, I do have one quick thing, which is we are, uh, I will be there uh, at the game. Uh, thanks to, you know, obviously the support from our patrons uh, for making that possible. And, uh, you, you know, if anyone wants to go for the press box there, it's a, everything's a bit different. But I'd love to try to be able to meet people. Uh, just, you know, let me know what's the best way to be able to find you. And if I possibly can, I will certainly love to to come say hi and to, to thank everyone who's a, who's a patron and supports this show and, uh, and even just watches this show week to week. So, uh, and then hopefully, Phil, I think you, me, and Robert are going to try to do a live, you know, from the press box at Levi's uh, show. So uh, uh, be sure that, you know, even if you're at the game, you tune in, you know, on your way back home because we will be doing a, hopefully a live from the stadium aftershock. We got to figure out how to integrate Alex still 
because he won't be there. But, uh, you know, I think we'll uh, we'll find a way to do that. We'll find a way to get you in there, Alex. Don't worry. <laughs> also, okay. also I'm kind of interested. No matter what. And also, I'm you're, kind you're, of interested you're, you're, you to can't see keep me if. Away. Here's, here's my quick question, and everyone can think about this. We'll talk, maybe talk about it once we see how it actually plays out. But could it be possible that the LAFC fans who are going to fill up a sizable portion of this stadium provide the funding for a new left-wing designated player? It's interesting to think about. Oh, my God. All right. On that note, good night, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you after the next match. Take care.